Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly UMS COVID-19 Community Conversation. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. If you're listening in on your computer speaker system and would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. I wanted to just take a moment to thank you again for joining us today. We value your time during this public health crisis. As we respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, UMS is hosting these webinars on a regular basis to ensure that you are fully up to date on our forward stance against this virus as well as the steps that you can take to combat COVID-19 in your daily life. It is important to us that we hear from you as well, so please submit your questions um, using the chat feature on the right. We are, going to talk, sorry, we are going to take a slightly different approach to this week's webinar. AMS President and CEO, Dr. Mohan Santa, and our, incident command, our AMS Incident Commander, Dr. David Marcosi, will be answering some of your questions that members of the public have raised over the past few weeks. We're going to be covering a number of topics, including sy symptoms, prevention, testing, and discussing the UMS response. You can also submit additional questions using the chat feature. But first, Dr. Sento will give us a status update on COVID-19 in our country, state, and medical system, as well as share some important resources that you need to know <clears throat> about uh, that you can help provide key information and answer questions. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Santa. Thanks, Chris, and thank you to everybody for joining us this week. Uh, we as the medical system are honored that you continue to turn to us as a trusted resource of information during this COVID-19 pandemic. It's also important to remember that we are indeed in this together, and each of you and your individual actions are critical to helping prevent the spread of COVID-19, and it is these actions that actually serve the greater good. Uh, this has been a challenging time for many of us, and, uh, and there's no question that we need to prevent the spread of this disease, and that includes canceling social gatherings. You know, we're dealing with closed schools. The requirements uh, that have been placed upon us to change the way we celebrate centuries-old religious holidays and for perhaps the first time ever in our lifetime. The holy month of Ramadan began yesterday at sundown, and throughout my many conversations with faith leaders in our communities, they've all made it clear that it is indeed necessary for all of you to stay home and to not have family over for what would otherwise be the traditional way that we celebrate holidays. We also need to think creatively about how we still recognize our religious tradition, uh, but to do so while practicing safe behaviors that are focused on the foundations of social distancing. And so using technology to connect with families and to connect into our faith communities is a critical part of how we maintain our health um, and also respect our faith tradition. So in terms of uh, where we stand in this uh, fight, uh, in the United States, here we have now seen uh, over 600 and, I'm sorry, 869,000 cases of diagnosed COVID-19 in the United States. Here in the state of Maryland, we have 16,616 patients who have been diagnosed with COVID. And here at the medical system, we currently have 48 patients who are defined as under investigation uh, and another 259 patients who have been proven to be COVID positive. To frame that up, uh, across our health system, since this healthcare challenge began, we've had 945 patients test positive for COVID who have been hospitalized within the medical system. And so this kind of gives a perspective of uh, the 
challenge that we are facing both as a state and as a nation. So it is clear that this virus uh, continues to spread throughout the state, and it is the actions that we are taking together that has undoubtedly helped flatten the curve. And it is now um, our ability, as we flatten that curve as a state, is to strategically utilize the resources that we have at our disposal to focus on the areas that are um, hotter than others in terms of disease activity. And also, it allows us to identify and care for our most vulnerable population. In terms of helpful resources that we have for our community, the medical system has established a free nurse call line that's staffed 24 hours a day by registered nurses, and you can call this anytime, day or night. The nurse call line number is 1-888-713-0700. The CDC has a COVID-19 self-checker tool on their website that helps evaluate for symptoms. And again, you can find more tips on managing your health and wellness at ummf.org slash COVID, that's C-O-V-I-D. In terms of community resources, if you or someone you know needs immediate assistance with connecting to community resources or mental health professionals, please reach out to the resources that are displayed on your screen. And they include the Disaster Distress Helpline, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, the Crisis Text Line, 211 Maryland, to connect to community services, Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence, Again, these are all community resources that we want to ensure people are aware of. We also want to emphasize the fact that there are resources that are specific for our senior population in the state of Maryland. The state of Maryland has a free opt-in telephone service that will check on Maryland seniors age 65 and older. After you register, you will receive a telephone call every day at a pre-selected time block. If a participant does not answer the first call, they'll be tried two more times. If these calls go unanswered, additional calls will be made to notify the alternative uh, people who have been pre-selected by the participants at the time of enrollment. Register online at aging dot maryland dot gov or by calling 1-866-502-0560. As we talk about being mindful of our health, we want to make sure that we, you know that we are also focused on your mental health and personal well-being. The medical system hosted additional community webinars through the program that we have already established that is described as not all wounds are visible. The series focused on having a community conversation regarding mental health and COVID-19. These webinars have covered how to manage your stress, how to help children cope with COVID-19, how to stay connected while social distancing, and you can find all of these webinars on at ummf.org slash not all wounds. Thanks, Dr. Senta. Now we will turn to answer some of the questions that you asked us last week. As a reminder, you can ask questions during today's session uh, via the chat function, which is on the right side of the screen. The first question is for Dr. Marcosi. What are the symptoms of COVID-19? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Dr. Senta. Most of us will experience some mild symptoms if you, are, uh, if you have COVID-19, and they can be anywhere from a fever to a mild cough, sore throat. Some people are actually even experiencing some loss of smell um, and even some maybe some mild shortness of breath. Uh, but you need to be careful. We need to be conscious of the fact that you might develop, those in the communities may develop some more serious symptoms, which are pneumonia 
increasing shortness of breath, chest pain. And it's important to emphasize that people with COVID-19 could also be asymptomatic. So you have mild, real severe, or even asymptomatic, which means really no symptoms at all. And the key is continued physical distancing so we don't spread the, spread this disease and making sure you're washing your hands and hand hygiene. And when you're uh, and staying out of work uh, if you're home uh, so you don't go back in and infect others and you don't get sick yourself if you're having any symptoms. If you have any concerns about this, you should be calling your doctor or any questions, or we have that UMS nurse call line that Dr. Santa mentioned. Thank you, Dr. Marcosi. Next question is also for you. I think I might have COVID-19. What should I do? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. So, you know, we need to – first thing you should do is, again, check those symptoms. You're either mild – if you're having severe symptoms, then that's a reason to go to the emergency department. But mild symptoms, you can call your doctor or call that nurse triage line that we spoke about and be able to give you some guidance on what the next steps are. And supporting your health at home um, if you have mild symptoms is important, staying hydrated, taking Tylenol for any fever, making sure you get enough rest. Those are important things that you individually can do to, if you're concerned you might have COVID-19. And also, if you're concerned, you need to make sure you're not spreading it to your family members. So if you're experiencing, though, a medical emergency, uh, make sure you, you call 911 or go to a local emergency department. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Marcosi, next question also for you. At what point after contracting the COVID-19 virus are you no longer contagious? You know, the science is still unfolding. What we know now is if you have a mild case of COVID-19 and are generally healthy, those mild symptoms or, or just even really, even almost no symptoms, uh, your body's likely to feel better after a few days of, 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 uh, after you're infected. And you could be totally recovered in about a week. Uh, the key is, though, uh, if you're mildly symptomatic, or in other words, you have mild symptoms or, and you've recovered, you could still be shedding this virus. Uh, so that's why there's a 14-day quarantine recommended for anybody who uh, gets COVID-19, tests positive, or has symptoms, never actually got tested, but has symptoms consistent with COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, next question is also for Dr. Marcosi. What steps should my family be taking to prevent COVID-19? Yeah, this is those basics, right? So keep your – cover your mouth when you cough. Cover your mouth when you sneeze or sneeze or cough into a tissue. Making sure your hands are clean and washing your hands for 20 seconds. Um, staying away from some of us who are more susceptible to this virus. In other words, those who have uh, other illnesses like asthma or COPD or heart disease or lung disease, any of those. We need to st – anybody who has had any of those – or has those diagnoses, you need to stay away from that if you're concerned you have COVID-19. In addition, you need to stay home and travel less, which means don't going to work as much, trying to telework, getting your groceries from potentially some uh, online resources or a neighbor, having them drop it off, and then also staying about six feet away from other people. And lastly, as you're seeing in the communities now and in our state, the CDC and our state is recommending that everyone in public wear a mask. Um, and that's an important thing. You can wash masks, which is important. You can reuse cloth masks, uh, but making sure you have a mask on. So not only do you, try not, do you not get infected, but you don't spread the virus if you are infected. Thank you, Dr. Marcosi. Next question is for Dr. Santa. My husband and I live alone. We are practicing all the guidelines put forth. My question is, if we take a drive and pack our lunches to eat in our car or in a place where there are no other people or maybe very few people who are practicing social distancing, are we still following guidelines for only essential travel? We do this once a week and think of it as a good, men as good mental health time for us. So thank you for that question, and I can completely understand why this kind of activity is viewed as uh, promoting mental health because we absolutely want people caring for both their mental health and their physical health during this stressful time. But it's also important to recognize that it is our collective responsibility to help us get um, through this surge. And we have to keep each other safe, and we have to follow the governor's orders to stay at home 
unless traveling for essential reasons. The current guidance from the Maryland Department of Transportation asks that we keep roadways clear for essential employees and citizens who are accessing food, medicine, or other key supplies. I will point out, though, that the stay-at-home order does not mean you have to stay inside. You can get outside in your neighborhood, get some fresh air, um, and do so by practice, still practicing social distancing and following the CDC recommendations regarding wearing a cloth mask when out in public. So that is what we would recommend in that setting. Thank you. Next question is also for Dr. Santa. I am really stressed out about the virus and all of the pressures my family is facing. What's the best way to care for my mental health? So again, I can completely appreciate why that is, because this is a challenge that is described as a once in multiple generations challenge. So we don't, ha all of us, we don't have the benefit of simply looking back and saying, well, what did we do the last time we faced a challenge like this? And that's why I think it is important that we as the medical system continue to want to emphasize being able to care for your entire health and well-being. So we've tried to provide resources on the topic of uh, mental health uh, on our UMMS COVID response page that is found at ummsorg slash COVID. And we always say we want people to be prepared but to not panic. Creating a contact list of important phone numbers, community resources, and other essentials in the event you need to access them. Get your news from trusted resources. But also, be, uh, be sure to take breaks from consuming news around COVID-19. Dr. Stephanie Knight, our Chief of Psychiatry at the University of Maryland Medical Center Midtown Campus, and a faculty member in the School of Medicine, suggested making sure that you have at least two conversations a day that do not involve a discussion of COVID-19. Social distancing does not mean social isolation. So staying connected with friends and family with the use of technology, whether that be phone calls, text, or video conferencing, uh, are ways to stay connected for sure. And self-care is very important. Maximize your healthy choices. Maintaining a daily routine that includes well-balanced meals, exercise, and plenty of sleep. Make time for activities that you enjoy. And Take all your medications as they are prescribed and stay in touch with your health care providers. Many providers, including those of us within the medical system, have dramatically increased access through telemedicine and telehealth resources. So please investigate those possibilities as ways of staying connected to your uh, health care providers. Thank you. Next question is also for Dr. Santa. Will we be able to go out and eat in public and sit down in a restaurant? So as a healthcare system, we are working with public health officials across the state of Maryland and our elected officials, uh, Dr. Marcosi, who is on this call, along with Dr. Wilbur Chen, two faculty members in the School of Medicine here at the University of Maryland have helped. They serve on the governor's task force, and they are working hard to determine what the future looks like in our state uh, as we define uh, Maryland strong and our road to recovery. So as we move to the recovery phase, we're fortunate that we have uh, significant voices in that conversation at a state level. Uh, the governor has indicated that he will uh, reopen Maryland's economy uh, gradually, and he's calling this plan Maryland Strong, a roadmap to recovery. His plan has four components that must be solidly in place before lifting any restrictions. They include expanding testing, increased hospital surge capacity, increasing our supply of personal protective equipment, and a robust contact tracing operation. These are the four essentials that help ensure that we as a healthcare community, are well positioned to continue to manage the patients who come to us with our COVID-19 symptoms as we start to reopen 
parts of our community. We do not know yet if the stay-at-home order will be extended at the end of this month, but whenever it's lifted, it's critical that we all have the responsibility and recognize the responsibility that we have to continue some habits like the hand-washing habits and cough and sneezing etiquette, etiquette that has been highlighted through this entire crisis because those are the behaviors that will help stop spread uh, this disease any further. Thank you. Dr. Marcosi, next question for you. How do you feel about using grocery delivery services? I think, uh, I think they're a good idea. I think grocery delivery applications, if you have access to them, allow you to stay out of the grocery store entirely. Uh, they can either be left at the, at the outside your door or you can go and pick them up so you don't actually have to go into the store. And the challenge is you want to make sure you're limiting your exposure to this virus, either by high-touch areas like a grocery cart or being in areas where people might be able to spread this virus to you. Uh, the, the thing to know is that if you use some of those apps, there may be a slightly longer wait times or delays in you getting whatever you need with regard to groceries. So see if your store will do, you know, the curbside checkups, uh, or pardon me, uh, the pickups, so that uh, you can actually go there and pick them up and don't have to actually enter the store. You can also ask a friend or neighbor who's going to the grocery store to pick up some things for you so you necessarily don't have to go. Thank you. Dr. Marcosi, next question also for you. I just found out I'm pregnant. Is there anything specifically that pregnant women need to do to be more careful? Well, first of all, congratulations. Um, that's, uh, this, it's wonderful news, uh, and uh, we wish you the best in your pregnancy. Uh, you know, pregnancy can be stressful, uh, and not only that, on top of that, we're dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic, so I appreciate what you're talking about. Uh, since, this, since the virus is new, there's a lot we're still trying to figure out uh, with regard to uh, the science behind this. And according to the CDC, we're not sure whether or not being pregnant makes a woman more at risk than the general public for contracting this virus. However, due to the changes in the body during pregnancy, you may experience an increased risk of some infections in general. So it's best to follow protective protocols like hand hygiene, or soap and water for your hands or alcohol-based sanitizer, making sure you're practicing social distancing, using a mask, stay away from people who potentially are sick, uh, making sure you, we all should be uh, washing areas of high touch, doorknobs, uh, sinks, uh, tables, uh, countertops, uh, light switches, anything that we touch in a, uh, that has the potential to spread this virus, we wanna make sure we're cleaning. And then obviously, if you have any concerns, calling your physician to, or our nurse triage line might be able to help you with answering some of those questions. Thank you. Dr. Marcosi, next question also for you. Should I be wearing a cough mask? Well, Governor Hogan signed an executive order requiring face masks or coverings while riding public transportation or inside any retail store, and that includes grocery stores. Uh, this is in alignment with the CDC's recommendations that everyone wear a homemade mask when in public. The University of Maryland Medical System actually already adopted this stance in the interest of safety across all of our hospitals, requiring masks to everyone who enters any of our facilities. If you can make a cloth mask at home using a bandana, bandana or old T-shirt, uh, there are links online to do so, or you could use our link at ums.org slash COVID, uh, again, ums.org slash COVID, and actually gives you instructions on how to, how to make a cloth mask. The, 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 the bottom line is this, wearing any type of mask, cloth masks in particular, helps reduce the likelihood of transmission, uh, but it does not reduce, uh, pardon me, it does not replace social distancing, so physical distancing. Ideally, you're wearing a mask and you're keeping six feet away from people. Uh, thanks. Uh, Dr. Marcosi, a related question. How should I clean my cloth mask? Properly using and reusing items such as a cloth mask are really important. Um, making sure uh, that your sewn or cloth, mask, cloth face mask um, is cleaned regularly is important. You can usually use a washing machine to do just that. Uh, a thorough washing with soap and water uh, soap and hot water should destroy any virus on your cloth mask, just as it does when you're washing your hands. Thank you. Another question for Dr. Marcosi. 
How do our hospitals plan to tackle the surge? We're tracking the current surge status across the University of Maryland system on a daily, if not hourly basis, and working with our local and state partners to address patient surges accordingly. The benefit of operating a 13 hospital system allows us to share the burden of patient surge and ensures that we have staff, space, and supplies when we need them and how we need them to maintain a high level of care. We have actually also opened UM, University of Maryland Laurel Medical Center as an acute care facility in partnership with the state of Maryland um, to make sure that we have enough surge capacity across our system uh, for any potential patients for COVID or, or any other potential illnesses or injuries. In addition to that, in partnership with the state of Maryland and Johns Hopkins, the University of Maryland Medical System helped transform the Baltimore Convention Center into a 250-bed field hospital in order to meet the demands and appropriately respond to COVID-19. The Convention Center is a field hospital and is part of the city and statewide plan to care for patients with COVID-19 who are recovering from their infection but who still need some help before they're able to go home. Thank you. Next question is for Dr. Santa. Are the ICU and ER departments overrun at UMS hospitals? If I had an emergency situation, is it still safe to go to the emergency room? So thanks, Chris. This is a really important question. The second half of that question, it is absolutely safe to go to an emergency room if you are in need of acute health care services. Uh, across our health system and around the state, we want our, our members of our community to understand that if you are having symptoms or if you are having health care issues that require urgent care, you need to call 911 and get to a hospital. One of our concerns here is that in our, throughout our communities, people might be so concerned about risk of exposure to COVID-19 that they are ignoring acute health care issues, and we do not want to see that. We know that our hospitals, our emergency rooms, are properly equipped to be able to safely provide acute health care. And so that's an important uh, point. Across our health system, we, again, are able to accommodate the current volume of patients that we are seeing across the system. I think, as Dr. Marcosi mentioned, we as a large health system have the benefit of being able to move resources to where the need is greatest. And across the state, we are seeing that there are areas that are having more um, impact in terms of disease burden in some parts of the state than others, and that allows us to address the needs where they exist. And then as those areas um, calm down a bit in terms of disease activity, we can move those resources again. And so we are responding as a health system, and it is our hope that we are demonstrating the benefit to the entire community uh, across the state of Maryland in terms of our ability to safely provide the care that they need. We have time for one last question. Uh, Dr. Santa, for you. When should I call 911 if I'm having serious symptoms associated with COVID-19? So there's no question that severe symptoms, severe symptoms, uh, that require immediate attention that may be associated with COVID-19 include trouble breathing. If you have persistent pain or pressure in the chest, if you have new confusion, or if you have a family member that you are having trouble arousing, you can't wake them up, or if you notice their lips or face are turning blue, these are all symptoms of a potentially life-threatening circumstance and need to call 911 and get to an emergency room right away. Thank you, Dr. Santa and Marcosi, and thank all of you um, who participated in today's webinar. We hope that you will stay connected. You can find our social media channels displayed on the screen, and we hope that you will sign up for health and wellness emails at ums.org slash email. Uh, Sorry, a reminder about our nurse call line. Uh, you can call that at any time. That is 
We are grateful for everything you are doing to keep yourself safe, you and your loved ones, and our community. And so on behalf of Dr. Santa and Marcosi, thanks again for joining us today, and have a great weekend.